Welcome to The Unconventional Path, entrepreneurship and innovation stories and ideas. Hello, I'm Bela Musitz. And I'm Mike Wasserman. Today, we're excited to be joined by Doug Weiss. Doug is the owner and general manager of Evergreen Subaru in Auburn, Maine. Now, you did this interview with Doug, and you've known him for a long number of years. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the interview and uh, how you went about it. Well, you know, I've been kind of bugging Doug to be on this for a long time, and we've kind of put it off and put it off and put it off, and we kind of decided, okay, now the time is right. And Doug's really got an interesting story. Um, he he graduated with a degree in journalism, and he started working for Automobile Magazine, and he was uh, served in a number of roles there and wrote articles about cars and drove really cool cars and, and really had a passion uh, for what he did. And then he moved over at one point to the corporate, corporate marketing side. Um, and then one day we kind of had an idea and, uh, it was based on a paper I was working on an academic paper. And, um, you, you know, and, and as you'll hear, we had kind of an idea to try to make the auto retail experience better for, for customers. Um, so he quit his job and we threw our life savings together. Uh, we had a third partner as well and started up this car dealership and so doug really kind of made this leap um you know didn't have a business degree or anything like that just had to kind of this passion to 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 go his own way um so you'll hear the story of this uh as we we talk over the the next 30 minutes or so um about how how doug still does this and i'm not involved anymore doug always did all the work and all honesty you know me i'm a, a good uh you know, sit in the background and cheerlead, but uh, Doug's really been the hard work behind this. And now I'm out, the other partner is out and Doug, Doug is the sole owner. So yeah, I think sit back and uh, listen to Doug's story and uh, we'll come back at the other side and talk a little bit about it. Hey, eh, Bela? Yeah, I thought it was a really good uh, conversation you had with Doug. And, you know, it has this common theme that you see with a lot of entrepreneurs. There's this basic fundamental initial idea and concept for kind of, which is the spark to start the business. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, as you get into it, you discover that some of your assumptions were incorrect. Uh, and I think that came through a little bit in your conversation with Doug. So with that, let's jump right into the interview uh, between you and Doug. In Bela, people will see a lot of our assumptions proved incorrect. <laughs> and a lot of it was on me. But yeah, let's go. Well, that's what makes it interesting. So let's jump into the interview. Here we go. Hello, listeners. This week's guest is Doug Wise. Doug is owner and general manager of Evergreen Subaru in Auburn, Maine. Um, Doug made a career pivot. He left a really good job in the automotive advertising sector to start uh, what was designed to be an innovative uh, automotive retail business. Uh, in uh, with, And he started with two partners. So full disclosure, one of those two partners was me. Uh, but I have since uh, left the the business. Both partners are left the business, and now Doug runs it by himself. So, Doug, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so let's just start. Kind of tell me a little bit about your background and how you became an entrepreneur. You no, know, if it's easy to pin that down, I suppose everybody has a similar thought, and that is, it was almost an awareness that it was there most of my life, where I, I felt like I wasn't quite in the right place doing something that I really appreciated. I mean, you and I have known each other most of our lives, and I think you've seen me early searching for what I wanted to do when I grew up. And I don't know if it became what I want to be when I grow up as much as how I want to do it. And the how is the more interesting piece, which is I like having – my hands around all aspects of the process. I don't like it when other people are making decisions or, or not involving me in the process. So what I enjoy, I think, about being an entrepreneur is being able to shape the universe in a way that I want it to be and what I want it to look like, and then bringing people along with me and, and, and helping them understand that vision and giving them the ability to carry that vision forward. So... 15 years into this experiment, I'm much less active in hour-to-hour -hour operations and day-to-day -to, -day to some extent, um, but I've really pulled the lens back to make sure that the, the people that I've delegated to understand the core mission, which is the culture we're trying to create and protect. Therefore, they can use that as a platform to make decisions every day when they're confronted with challenges. 
Interesting. Do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about Evergreen and kind of what the original idea was and how it evolved to where it is today? The original idea was you and me kicking around the idea that um, buying a car shouldn't have to suck. Remember, that was our original mission statement. And, and it still is to this day, I would think that people here would understand and they hear an echo of that in what we talk about every day. But, but the idea was that automotive retail is a pretty, boy, it's got some stigma to it. The reputation of the industry is pretty bad, right? Car dealers lie, cheat, and steal. And we thought, well, it wouldn't be hard to make a difference. It really, you know, I was in the communications end of that business in those days where we were doing a lot of support for retail uh, environments. And so I was starting to get a, an ear to that world where I was listening for how those conversations are going, at least in print. We're making brochures, we're making point of sale materials, and it seems like, man, this is simple. We just need to talk to people in a way that's respectful and clear, and this will be an easy process to change. And you and I started kicking that idea around, and that's where we reached out and brought a third partner into the conversation, which was really somebody who had expertise in kind of the, the, the franchise development world. And, and we thought about, all right, how would we put this pitch together? Because <clears throat> if we were listening to us talk about it, we would have no interest because these guys don't have a background in it. They don't have experience in retail. We have automotive industry experience, but not on the, on the retail side. So how are we going to crack through and get somebody to listen to this pitch? And so we start talking through it and put together a business plan and found um, a willing partner who didn't have a lot of layers of corporate decision-making. We were able to go into Subaru of New England, which is a wholly owned subsidiary or distribution corporation, rather, which had a single decision-maker that we could get in front of. And, and so we soft pedaled a little bit our revolutionary ideas, but just came in and said, look, we, um, we think we can do retail better, but we can get in and have a great customer experience. And that's what we're going to start, start with. And we think that that will help um, establish a, a business in an in underdeveloped market. And then we launched knowing almost nothing, right? And we launched and we hired some people and you, we had a building built and all these things. And what happened after we opened the doors? Well, you know, this is an interesting piece. When you put a business to get plan together and you have a real clear vision for what you want things to look like and you get everything thought through because, you know, we're studious people. We, with three of us, knocked our heads together and we had a brilliant plan that was foolproof and it was going to be something we could um, easily implement. And what we found was that the business changed us more than we changed the business. And that was one of the early lessons is that, um, you know, the first thing you need to know as an entrepreneur is be flexible. Look at, spend a lot of time thinking and, and revising. Um, where I think I didn't understand I had um, a skill set that was going to be relevant at the time. But looking back, I think one of the more, important skill sets that I brought to the table of the three of us is I had a journalistic background and I'm not a, an egotistical proud person. Um, I like getting it right and I like playing games well. And as I started getting into this and looking at what we were trying to do, and I can get into specifics in a minute, but in general, when I looked at the overall business plan and the strategies that we had developed, I quickly realized that they weren't working. And, and I needed to spend a lot of time trying to find people smarter than me and um, farther along this journey than I was to start asking them questions. And that was kind of the journalist side. I'm, I'm okay just walking in admitting I don't know it. And, and, and in some ways, by not having a background in the business, it made it perfectly easy. And I don't think people found me a threat either. So that I found a lot of willingness to discuss with me um, what strategies were working and where <laughs> what's interesting about and I'm I'm sure this is true of every business world but you get 10 car dealers in a room you're going to have 10 strong opinions and rarely will they be aligned um one of the early processes I was able to get involved with is a professional group that meets three or four times a year in a facilitated group we're non-competitive markets but we're all in the same business and 
that information sharing has been the one thing that kept me afloat through all this. I went to my first meeting and it was drinking from a fire hose and I came home with literally 30, 40 pages of notes of things I had to fix and figure out and understand. And it was, it was going through that process of paying attention, trying to figure out what was not working, reaching out and asking questions and just kind of um, learning the lessons through the fight that, that helped us get a little stronger every month and every year and, and a little bit more ingrained in the, in the market. Yeah. I remember, you know, that call afterwards that you made to me was, you know, and we both at this point knew we we were so wrong on so many things and there were so many things we didn't know. And I've never been more wrong in my life about things. And but I remember that call saying, OK, the the bad news is, is we, we are we're really off on a lot of things. And you, but the good news is, is that I, I think I see the way and I think I see the people that can help us fix it. And, you know, we were bleeding a lot of red ink at that time and it was uncertain. I remember whether we could keep this going, this dream that we had or not. And uh and yeah, this this group um, sponsored by the the National uh, Dealer Association of right. They were you know just to make sure the listeners understand. So you would go to a meeting somewhere else outside of the Northeast with different brands and different dealers that weren't in the Northeast and weren't Subaru dealers, and they would share ideas. So you weren't competing. And these industry groups, we've talked about them a couple more times on the on the podcast over the last couple of years. But this was a really influential piece, Doug. And and as you said, this was a, a real game changer, and it's something that I think listeners in different industries should go out and seek um, to, tr to try to find. And then the other thing you found is some really good mentors, right, that, that we're really willing to share with you. What was that like? Well, that was, you know, a continuation of the, of the industry group. And it's essential that, that I think that no successful entrepreneur has ever gone alone completely. Um, I think when you read the business story afterwards, you're impressed by what that person has done individually. And there are a few unique exceptions, I think, who are just purely um, brilliant geniuses who can just see a clear path and, and navigate it. And those disruptors are a whole different category. But I think there's guys like me who are just run-of-the-mill entrepreneurs who need to network and listen and talk. And I think when you have these sounding boards that, that you – both respect and trust, it becomes a really helpful sounding board because, you know, nobody can think through problems in a vacuum. Um, you have to have a, a board of something, of some way that you trust and, and can sound an opinion or a thought and trial balloon a few things before you implement. And, and it's also helpful to have people who have, you know, none of these ideas in my industry are all that new. I mean, anything that I've ever come up with has been tried by somebody else before, and it's really nice to be able to pick up the phone and say, okay, you try it, how did it work, what were the problems, what were the solutions, and, and what are the, you know, there's always going to be a trade-off. There's always going to be some aspects that will move you forward and some aspects that will compromise something. And to be able to vet that in a, in a room that's safe and trusting and, and um, supportive is, is really helpful because then you can, kind of, by the time you roll out an idea or a new plan, it's, it's not the first time it's going. You kind of have a, an expectation of what's going to happen and you can modify it from there, but you're not going in brand new the way we did, right? When we first started, that's the difference between kind of the, the 2.0 and the 3.0 business plan was that, that I had a sense of how it was going to go and some of the, the opportunities that we were implementing rather than when you and I started this day one with the whiteboard, we really didn't have any contrasting points of view to our ideas. It was all, we liked the ideas and, and therefore they were going to work. And what was, do you remember one of our first mantras when we started, um, when we started learning the lessons of our business plan and, and making changes, I think you and I discussed more than once that we have to remember that quote, we are not our customer. And mm -hmm that that mantra was really to remind ourselves that just because we like an idea doesn't mean everybody will. And in this particular segment of the retail world, we do have to be all things to all people. It's really hard to, you know, in, in this particular brand in New England, Subaru is a top three brand right now. So we can't really talk about it in a niche way and we can't appeal to a specific customer. We have to have broad appeal. 
And if you're going to have broad appeal, you, you've got to drop your own sensibilities and remember that this is what the market wants, not necessarily what I want. Yeah, Doug, this has been immortalized in a sense in my classes. So I think in the interim since we started and to today, I've taught at least, I think, 2,500 or 3,000 students, something ridiculous like that. And this is the one thing that I tell them, if you learn nothing else, ingrain this in your mind when you're learning about entrepreneurship and innovation. So, uh, yeah, we learned it the hard way. It was an expensive lesson to learn in a lot of ways. But uh, at least I think other people <laughs> have benefited from uh, from our, our, our the wisdom that we that we got the hard way, you know? But isn't it, it's kind of a complimentary thought to be flexible. Because I think if you ever get set in your ways as an entrepreneur, you've got a wake up call coming. Um, it, it, you're just constantly, I mean, has COVID taught us nothing else that the market is dynamic and to expect unexpected and threats are out there. And, and when, they, when they come on the horizon, you have to identify them early and even if you didn't identify it early, you have to, to recognize what opportunities have gone by by the time you see the, the threat real and adapt as quickly as you understand the problem. It's an interesting story, Doug. How, how have you kind of changed your management style because of COVID and how have you helped your employees manage all this stress and uncertainty? I don't think I changed my management style at all. I think some of the startup lessons that we had early benefited me in the COVID reset. Um, it, it, it was more COVID, having gone through a startup, it prepared me for COVID. So what COVID felt like in March and April when we started having, um, it, it, I, I was having PTSD flashbacks to the early days of the business because on any, every day and every hour, things were changing at a high rate and we had a whole bunch of unknowns and we had to adapt our, our business operations, our business practices. We had to invent new things. They're not brand new things, but we had to understand what is the threat of this virus and how are we going to protect our staff and our customers um, as, we're, as we're staying open because we were automotive service, not the retail side, but the service side was considered an essential business. So we were still allowed to be open in the initial days and throughout the first quarantine phase, I was coming to work every day. So I have a very unusual experience for most people's COVID experience. Or I was coming to work wishing I could stay home, um, thinking about, you know, my family is quarantined. Um, they're staying out, of, you know, they're staying out of the line of fire, so to speak. But I was putting my, my body on the line every day because we had to be open. Um, and then we had to figure out how do we, what do we have to implement to keep procedure-wise to keep people safe. So we were building procedures day after day, revising them the same way we were doing it in the early days. And I think that those early lessons served me well. And, and one of the early mantras that I had to absorb was um, controlling my emotions through highs and lows and, and trying to have perspective in the middle of the worst of things. Um, early in the startup phase, we did lose a lot of money, and we were we we there was no reason we, we should have continued in business. We really should have flamed out. But in the worst moments, I tried to keep my spirits up by just mentally staying zen and neutral, and just trying to say this is just a game. We're just yeah, this isn't life and death. Also, COVID had an asterisk there, but in the early startup days, it's not life and death. Treat this unemotionally and solve the problems. And I had the same response to myself when we would have victories along the way, which is don't let the highs get too high either, because there's always one of those deep lows somewhere. And in the midst of the deep lows, you've got to remember that there are some, we've had some successes in the past and there's, there's reason to expect we'll have some in the future. So that same mantra has been one of my kind of, you know, my central pieces of advice to people as I've talked to them about business. If, if somebody's asking me about going into an entrepreneurial world, I'm, I instantly go there, which is don't let the highs get too high and don't let the lows get too low. Stay balanced because you know it will eat you up mentally and physically if you let it get to you. So you can't. You gotta, if you can treat it like a game, if you can separate, um, play hard, play well, Think through all the problems, solve them, but don't let it get to your emotional core because that'll break you. And that was certainly when in the COVID world in March, 
we had threats from a revenue standpoint, we had threats from an expense standpoint, and we had threats from a physical health standpoint. So we've kind of had three different pieces that we had to think through. Um, obviously, the health being a primary one. I mean, we were keeping people in the building when we didn't know how quickly this was going to circulate. I mean, I don't know about you, but in the first second half of March, right, we were trying to figure out if this was going to be a tsunami that was just going to wash over the entire population in a matter of weeks, or you know, how quickly would the rate of travel of the disease spread. And in those early days, I think we all felt like that we're, you know, we were worried about every contact with every person. And so deploying all of the, the screens and the masks that were hard to get and the hand sanitizer that was hard to get and all of, you know, employing those solutions, putting tape lines down, um, social distancing measures in the building. We closed our showroom. We turned off the lights. We, we, we started doing a lot outside. Fortunately, it was March, and so we could start to go outside in Maine a little bit. And, and you know, we closed down our, our waiting room, and we took our service loaners, and we put them outside, and we were cleaning them every cycle so that while we had closed our waiting room for service, we were inviting people to go outside and like, hey, you've got a little self-contained service waiting area. You've got heat, you've got your your entertainment system, and when you're done, we're going to sanitize it with um, with alcohol spray. So that was, you know, it was strategies like those that we started to develop day after day to to cope and keep us going. Um, but you know, the other two threats we had were were revenue and expense, and the, on the expense side, we had to kind of dig deep and decide how much of our staff we could keep on. And while we did close our, our sales department inside the building, we, we kept conducting sales online through the phone and we kept most of our team intact. And that was a, a tough choice early, but I guess the other piece of entrepreneurship is that you learn quickly that you're only as good as your team is. And it's taken us years to put together a good team. And it was, um, the harder decision was trying to dismantle this team and then think about reassembling it again. That felt like a harder climb than sustaining the, the, the increased expense through our revenue threats. And fortunately, um, we got lucky. I think we're in, a, we're in an easy sector from that standpoint because um, people still were driving miles and they still had cars that were breaking and, and the essential workers needed to get to work. Even in the lowest point of March and April on the demand side, our service world was still at full capacity. I mean, full disclosure, we have been underserving our market for several years now because we don't have enough capacity. But even in the worst of the slowdown, our current facility couldn't keep up. So, you know, I think sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you're good and sometimes there's a combination. Yeah, amazing. Um, just it's been amazing to me to watch as it was before, because I've always been on the sidelines. Just to clarify, Doug's always been the operational person. And back when I was when we were in the business together, he was still always the operational person and I was the professor on the side. But it's always still been gratifying for me to watch kind of how you've responded and pivoted and innovated, even though I'm in Germany and still being a professor. Um, still really cool to see this this responsiveness and this and this creativity and um, just the cool stories left and right and uh, uh, amazing response to, to a huge challenge. And, you know, the other part of this is customers are stressed, right? Customers were rightly so, right? You're, you, the customer base changed in terms of expectations and fears and what they wanted. And, um, you know, that probably wasn't easy, too. It's not as, easy, as important as the first three things that you talked about. But still, you're right. The needs of the customers have changed. Well, ironically, I would love to go back to March, April from a customer standpoint, because while retail is never easy and customer t expectations are always high, I think in those early times, the people who were coming in were so grateful and so appreciative and so patient. I think the world got patient for a little bit, where we just gave everybody the benefit of the doubt and they would look and see that we were trying and that we hadn't maybe figured out everything, but the fact that we were attempting to implement change to um, a, a new COVID world, I, um, universally we found you know, staff and customers easier to work with. Everybody was accommodating. Um, we didn't have the kind of, um, you know, they, they just, we have a very me-centered world. And I think in the customer environment where we rightly have said the customer is always right, there are customers who take that to the extreme 
and, and lose their manners in the process and not necessarily respectful and appreciative. Boy, it was kind of nice during that first phase of quarantine and COVID where the world got more patient. I know I did as a customer. You know, I, I suspended my need to have immediacy. And, and that bought everybody a smile. Love it. Uh, I want to I want to take a little pivot ourselves in this conversation because there's two pieces more on the personal side that I think are interesting for the listeners. And um, one is, you know, I asked you earlier, and we didn't quite get to it. And I want to circle back is, um, did you and I asked this, we asked this to a lot of guests, but um, do you have a family history of entrepreneurship? I mean, were there people in your life growing up that were entrepreneurs that you kind of saw and that influenced um, kind of what you talked about, always want knowing that somehow you wanted to have can, can kind of the, have your hands on all of an operation or all of a, of a business? I didn't have kind of day-to-day -day guidance in terms of how to make that transition or what you do to get there. But I had this kind of inspirational idea of what entrepreneurship looked like and felt like. And I think that was my guiding light. I mean, you and I many times early in my life had conversations of me just kind of plodding around thinking about it, but not understanding what that clear vision looked like. I mean, implementation was hard. I couldn't quite make that pivot from the emotional desire to do it to a practical idea of, oh, here's what it looks like. Here's what I want to do. Um, and it really took, um, you know, late mid-career. I'm still being disappointed, not necessarily with what I was doing, but just, um, feeling um, like I was underutilized. And that wasn't a knock against any particular employer. It was just that in my day-to-day -day work world, I never felt fully satisfied. And so it was that lingering, unfed need that was dormant, that I hadn't fed, that, that caused me to continue to look at ideas and think, oh, could I do that? And when we tripped along automotive retail, and I don't, I don't know if we need to go down that wormhole, but the the idea became clear, like, oh, we could make a difference here. And the the barrier to entry seemed lower than it truly was or truly is. And I think that was maybe one of the other um, misses that we had was we thought it was an easier entry than it, it was or should have been. Um, but once I began to have a vision for how to get there, it was clear that the risk was much lower than the reward. And I think that's I mean, risk tolerance is a whole different category of conversation. Um, and I think financial risk tolerance for me has never been an issue. I don't know why. It just, I knew that the, the, the limited resources that I had been able to scrounge together, the risk of losing that was much lower than the risk of looking back at some day and not having tried something. That was, when I looked at it, it was a clear answer to that question for me, which is, you know, 15 years from now, if I look back and I lost everything I invested, will I be upset about that or will I be more upset about not having tried it? And for me, the not having tried it, part of the answer was the more troubling piece. Yeah. And, you know, thinking back on your granddad, who I had the good fortune to meet a few times. I mean, I know when you were spending all the summers up there working with him um, in northern Michigan, uh, but he had a life well lived, right? And he built this business and was respected in the community. And, you know, I'm sure not always loved by all of his employees, but respected by his employees and helped provide a lot of people with income in an area of the world that didn't have a lot of a lot of money and a lot of successful businesses. It's a cool thing to look back on the life that your grandpa and grandma led in northern Michigan. And then for me to see what you built with your wife and your kids. And it's really a cool thing. And hopefully, you know, we can ride this out until you retire. But um. But, I, you know, to me, I see a lot of parallels in the life that your your grandpa led and, and the life that you're leading. And it's all through, you know, blood, sweat and tears. There's like you said, a little bit of luck and 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 along the way. But it's it's a lot of work. Your granddad worked really hard and you saw that and you've worked really hard. And I've seen that. And uh, and I think I, I think the parallels are interesting. Well, but for me, those pieces don't don't they don't feel relevant. What's interesting to me about the running a business and being an entrepreneur is not the kind of the, the life that you, you maybe see from the outside, but it's the satisfaction that I have of problem solving. And I think that what I, you know, I had this discussion with my brother a few days ago about a personal thing, but, you know, he, he's an entrepreneur in a bigger corporate corporation, but I look at my friends and peers in the Subaru uh, dealer world and I look at, you know, other people I know in this level, 
it's not about anything but problem solving. It's it, what's nice about having a business and being an entrepreneur is that you never, it's an inexhaustible supply of problems coming along. And if you enjoy solving them, you're a successful entrepreneur. And if you don't, then get out of the game. But it's really just that continuous flow of things to have to look at, to adjust, to fix, that just gives my personality satisfaction. And I think that's probably the common thread of, among you, uh, entrepreneurs that you would find is that, that, that fixing problems is more fun than having a problem fixed. I love that definition, Doug. It really works for me. I'll have to put that into my classes too again and steal yet another thing from you. So um, love it. The, the last thing I want to talk about in terms of your personal life, if it's okay, and, and feel free to decline. But, you know, um, you and I always, um, you know, we like to play soccer and and you were always a skier and things like that that i never was we like to joke that you are a high velocity person and i live the low velocity lifestyle um and it's still true to this day so doug one last thing i want to talk about in terms on the personal side if it's okay is um there was a lot of stress early on you became a parent two times and um i was just in awe of kind of how you manage everything but one of the things that you did is really took up running with a passion. And it's something that I never would do, but something that I respected uh, a lot out of you. And I think that it's always interesting to learn from entrepreneurs how they deal with some of the stresses that I think a lot of entrepreneurs have to a much greater extent than people who have a more traditional job, like say a professor. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about that process and how you found it and what it did for you and and, and a little bit about, about that side of, of it? Sure. I, I it, as all things have been with this journey. It's been an organic process and transition. But for me, it was finding a way to manage stress. And what I wanted when I went into an entrepreneurial world, one of the things I remember thinking was I wanted flexibility. I wanted control over my schedule and my world. And, you know, I've, I've had this running joke when people stop and are like, oh, you own a business? And I'm, my response to Charlie, well, oh, it kind of owns me. Um, you know, the thing about having a business is that there's never a vacation and there's never a day off and there's never an hour off. I mean, the problems, you know, we talked about problem solving at one point in this conversation and how much that appeals to me. But the downside is the problems are never taking a vacation and they're never going to honor your schedule. They're, they present themselves when they're there. So that always on, always engaged piece can be um, very tiring. And what I found early in this world where I was working many more hours than I do now, but I, I would just go home completely depleted, completely exhausted, nothing left. And I didn't realize at the time I had done very little physical exertion. It had been 100% mental. And finding that balance is what has driven really the, the running and the cycling and, and now swimming. I'm trying to kind of add all three together, mostly just to keep my body healthy because any, you know, I found that just running was probably not the best idea for me long-term, but the, the, when I was able to discharge my physical battery in concert with my mental battery, I found better balance. And the other aspect was, the one place, and you know, I'm, I'm one of those runners, um, and this is the thing I like about cycling, which is I don't have music going. I don't have anything going but my head able to drift. There's no phone calls. There's nobody asking me for something. There's no, I find that you know, that's the one escape I have, and to some extent, it's more of a meditative place than, a, than anything else. It allows my brain just to unplug and drift because generally that's the only time of day or week that I get that. So... Um, I started down the slippery slope of distant training because it was such a, a positive feedback loop that I would, I would feel better about myself. I would feel better physically. I would feel, feel better mentally. It was a one place that could kind of hang up my stress and, and channel it. Love it. And I saw the difference in, again, something that I really think is cool. And right, you had some really lofty goals and, and really met mo almost all of those goals before kind of um, – the the miles add up right and uh, and you've kind of switched your gears now to more of the uh, like you said the the biking and the swimming which is the next set of challenges but yeah i mean uh, uh, great piece of advice here everything from in terms of not 
uh, you are not your customer all the way through uh, being flexible and, and being able to pivot and being lo loving problem solvings and now to, to this kind of to have something to um, you know it doesn't have to be running but have something that you can make sure that you're relieving that stress so that when it is time to be a parent and be a partner and uh, be, be a family member you can be fully present and, and balance all these things because that was always something that I worried about watching you do this is making sure that you didn't burn out and um, so I just thought that was an interesting thing to share. So thanks for kind of sharing that with the with the listeners. Um, any other advice to people kind of who are thinking about becoming an entrepreneur and kind of leaving the corporate world other than what we've talked about? Anything else stick in your mind is something that might be interesting to share? I suppose the biggest piece of advice I would have is is channeling your expectations and, and understanding, you know, what what truly your risk is. Um, if if you are unable to um, unable to tolerate losing an investment 100% all of it, um, if you think if that scares you to the point where that's more scary than life or death, it's probably the wrong answer. But if you can look at it from more of a academic game playing standpoint of saying, yep, it's there, and if it's not, I'm still okay. Um, even if if you know I'm talking about bankruptcy or being completely out of cash. Um, so I'm just going to rise the next day. I'm going to get out of bed. I'm probably going to find breakfast somehow, some way, and I'll start rebuilding. Um, I, it, for me, having the game flame out was never um, my biggest concern. Um, I was always kind of looking at what can we fix, what can we make happen, and if it all disappears, you know what? We can reinvent. And and I think that's the biggest question you've got to ask yourself if you're if you're thinking about an entrepreneurial um, experience, which is, can you envision, you can never envision what it's going to look like, but as long as you can accept what failure looks like, you can jump in and figure the rest out. I love it. You know, it's, it's nice because the name of this podcast is The Unconventional Path. And I think if you look at you and I at like kind of, you know, 15, 16 years old, when we first really became great friends, um, you know, certainly you have taken an unconventional path in lots of different ways. So it's kind of neat to to kind of line that up with everything that you've said so far. And, and the advice that you just gave, I think is great is if you want to choose that path and kind of know yourself, know your risk tolerance, know what you're willing to accept and, uh, and don't be afraid to make that leap. Cause once you have that baseline, it's, it's not that hard. Great. Uh, anything I should have asked you, but didn't, or anything you want to ask me, Doug, you know, you invested in the business, you were part of a startup and, and you were exited along the ride and, and, how does that look? For, how does that look then? How does that look now? Uh, good question, Doug. And uh, I think that the the answer is pretty clear, actually. So, you know, one of the things that you if well, I mean, I learned this, I think, teaching um, and that's how to be a, a good listener and that's how to read the situation. And I think, um, you know, you had sent some signals to both partners that you wanted full control over the business. And, um, you know, I think I tried to pick up on that and pick up on the frustrations that you had and just kind of from the day to day side, the understanding the risks and the time that you put into it and understanding that you had to put uh, kind of an exit plan together that made sure that you got what you needed um, out of the business when it was time for us to retire, right? I had a whole separate retirement <laughs> kind of plan and I had a job in place. So kind of listening and, and cluing into that, um, you know, it was, it was clear that I don't think it would continue t t forever. Now, what was never negotiable between you and I was our friendship. And that was always from day one. And that was never in doubt, but there were challenges there for kind of making it work is what was going to work for a fair return. What was going to work that, you know, I got out of it, what I needed to get out of it and taking into account all the, the taxes and all these things what you could support in terms of making sure the business stayed in business so that you could accomplish your goals. Cause as important as it was for me to get what I, we needed out of it, I needed to make sure that you were going to get what you needed out of it. And this was kind of an interesting dance, but you know, there's a lot of moving parts and, you know, I think we can be very honest that, um, that it was stressful when people say, Oh, don't get into business with your best friends. Cause it's going to be a problem. We, you know, we saw some of that, but as long as I think people are, you, you know, both friends are committed to keeping the friendship alive and just listening and figuring out what's needed. And it's just like in any negotiation, right? Really thinking it through and, and being patient and not saying things that you'll regret. You and I made it out of this 
I think, really well. And I'm satisfied with where we're at. I'm satisfied with what I got out of it. I learned an incredible amount without putting in all the blood, sweat, and tears that you did. I had a lot of sleepless nights too on the financial side, but um, you know, I was you know ever grateful to what to what you did and for being a part of it. And you know, I wouldn't trade it. That's that's for sure. So I guess that's what it looks like from from my side. What's it look like from your side? Well, you know, certainly the the re- different angles to look at. I I like you always had this point of view that the friendship was non-negotiable and that it is the hard part for me in initiating the discussions to disband the partnership was, was feeling disloyal and feeling like um, I could threaten the friendships. And those were certainly the, the prime directives for me as I was trying to negotiate that process. Um, oddly enough, it, it, you know, I've said this to you before and, and I emotionally, it's never really been about the financial side as much as the emotional reward where, you know, when you're driving the bus or the plane and feeling like the controls are somewhat limited and the, the um, ability to maneuver is somewhat limited, it's a little bit, it's difficult to be in that seat all the time without all the controls at your disposal. And that analogy, I think, is probably the, the clearest one I can, can give is when you've got a couple of co-pilots uh, kind of remotely helping you fly and you're in a seat, um, you want to be able to take a fighter jet any direction you need to take it, and you don't want to have to think about which controls are being pulled at the time and have a discussion about it. So I think that's the bigger piece of what that transition looked like. But, but similarly, um, as you're going through that negotiation, it's really important to understand what the ultimate achievement. And for me, it was making sure everybody felt um, like they, they've been treated fairly. And uh, that was always, uh, that was always, you know, from both sides, to be honest. Um, and that was always the goal. But the fact that we can still have a, you know, uh, a, a, a conversation like this feels like success. Totally. But some really good lessons there too, for listeners to pull out of this, you know, in terms of if, Especially, I think, you know, if you're going the VC route, it's different because you don't, it's not a, you lose control immediately when you get lots of investors. But if you're a, a solo entrepreneur and you're trying to make this decision of whether you go alone or bring in partners, you just need to understand, you know, we didn't even know that, right? I mean, we couldn't have done it. Any, none of us could have done it individually, but we didn't even know that going into it. And that is this really interesting thing to think about. And it's something to talk over in the beginning. Think about it from the accounting perspective and the legal perspective is once you bring in partners, you're obligated. I mean, for for you, it was also ethical, right? As I didn't, you know, you had a little by a 1%, right, a controlling share, but ethically, you always want to run everything by the other partners. And that took time. And it was frustrating. Sometimes, I mean, you know, I'm very open about this. The less I realized I knew, the less pushback I, you know, I gave to you on things, right? And as you learned more, I kept my mouth shut more and more. Um, and I think that was a good thing. But um, but it is it's it's if you are going to enter any kind of partnership where more than one person has the decision making kind of responsibilities that that idea, like you said, of one person having control over the controls and being able to make the decisions is really important. So I think that's an important takeaway and an important lesson for people to think about if you're thinking about being a kind of a solo entrepreneur or something where you're going to have partners is is that that really I saw from, you know, from my standpoint and kind of being empathetic to what you were going through, that that was a big deal. All right. I think this, you know, we're looking at the time, Doug, and time has flown and we've really talked for quite a while and we could probably do three more episodes together. But I really appreciate the time that you spent. And I think the the things that you shared with our listeners are uh, hopefully for them really interesting. But I think there's some great lessons. And, you know, again, this has always influenced my teaching, which has been great. Um, So yet more things here, I think, to to add to my classes and share with my students. So uh, on behalf of the podcast, thanks. And behalf of, uh, of me, thanks, Doug. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's always so much fun talking to you, Mike. I can't uh, can't say thank you enough. All right. Well, that's it for now, Doug. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mike. Talk to you. All right. Well, Bela, what did you think? Interesting story. Anything jump out at you? You know, I thought it was great. Uh, and, and you know, it's interesting because at least I never thought of car dealers as sort of being entrepreneurs, right? It's always been this sort of. Hmm. I don't know how they get that. Oftentimes they're long running family businesses handed down from mm-hmm. one generation to the other. You know, there's been some consolidation going on in the industry in the last number of years, at least around where I live. Uh, but I never really thought of those folks as entrepreneurs. And your conversation with Doug sort of gave me a whole different insight into how entrepreneurial 
these car dealers are. And they're fundamentally running franchises. So, mm-hmm. so you know, within a franchise, there's these rules and regulations that the mothership sort of imposes on you that you sort of have to live by and follow through. So you don't have, a, oftentimes you don't have a lot of latitude in sort of setting up and running the business 100% like you want to. There's some constraints and, and boundary conditions that you have to uh, abide by. But I was fascinated by it. And, I, you know, to me, the original premise that you guys talked about was how do we improve the customer buying experience, right? I think if you look at a lot of surveys, you know, going to the dentist and buying a car are right up there on the non-fun things that people sort of think about doing. And if you think about most purchasing experiences these days, if you look at the last 20, 30 years, on average, I would say that the customer experience has improved. Service has improved. Delivery has improved. So sort of many aspects of that have improved because corporations have embraced that and they have figured out that it's really important. But still, in many situations, the car buying experience (laughs) is less than a lot of fun, right? There's all this negotiations and back and forth. So your original premise really struck me as as being valid. Uh, And then sort of it didn't turn out that way exactly. And what I like to think about is just as any business plan is just a plan, as soon as you take that first step, the plan changes. And uh, I think you guys experienced that for sure. Definitely. Uh, had to be very flexible and very responsive and very, you know, this ability. Doug talked about him, him being humble, and that's really true. You have to be able to admit you're wrong and then, and then be willing to find people that can help you fix it. And that's what Doug did. Um, yeah, you know, the, the uh, people that buy a car a lot of time, this is the second largest purchase in a person's life, right? And if you buy a house, right? And for some people, it's the largest car. And why, did it, why does it suck so bad, right? Why is it so universally panned? And there are a lot of reasons for it. And we were wrong about some of the things, which was a lot of the, the parts. It was interesting. And, you know, what you said about it being a family business and things like this, this is true. Everybody said when we started, had this idea that you'll never get a franchise because you either have to be in the family business or had been a general manager. I mean, we got a franchise with zero operational experience because we had these kind of interesting, somewhat radical ideas. And the, like Doug said, the, the parent organization was interested in trying us out and as an experiment. Um, and, you know, I don't know, it'd be interesting to hear what they say now, but, um, but Doug's been successful with a lot of ups and downs, but overall successful, which has been great and makes a nice living for himself and his family. And, you know, it's, it has lots of employees and paying taxes and contributing to the economy. And sure, definitely uh, learned a lot from before I got into the, that we got into this than, than now in terms of the challenge of, of being in any franchise, you know, whether it's a car dealer or um, a fast food restaurant or whatever, you have a lot of restrictions and it really limits your ability to be creative and be responsive. Um, but in some ways you have to, because think about it, it's really a commodity business. Right. Whether you're buying a hamburger or a car, a new car. Right. You can buy the same product from many different places. You can you know, if you don't like how clean your McDonald's is in your neighborhood, you can drive a couple of miles and get to another one. Right. And the same thing with buying a car. It was a commodity and people were competing. All the dealers in the region were competing on price. And then, you know, when when we started, the Internet wasn't a huge thing. But, you know, as obviously in the last 15 years, it's grown as a channel where people are buying cars, which is even up the pressure even more. So it's a high pressure business to be in. Margins are really thin, a lot thinner, I think, than most people realize um, when when you're talking about new car sales. And yeah, Doug's really had to be entrepreneurial and really had to pivot a couple of times and was really fortunate, as he said, to meet people, uh, especially in this this group of other non-competing car dealers. That was hugely important to him in terms of learning the ropes um, and figuring out the right metrics to look at and adjusting processes in the right way. Um, just super critical. So yeah, real learning experience for everybody. I mean, that Doug got way more out of this than like getting an MBA or something like that, right? Just really learn nuts and bolts business and the grind of kind of doing good customer service day in and day out and financial controls and strategic planning and um, the financing and kind of understanding your cash flow and managing your debt and your equity and all these things. It's just so much at one time. And all the while you're trying to keep cars moving right and keep them serviced and keep customers happy was a huge challenge 
Yeah, you know, th- there's a couple of things that that you and Doug talked about that we have heard over and over again in in our conversations with entrepreneurs, and uh, you know, one of them is finding good talent to build the team. That's a challenge, uh, and and making and 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 learning the skill on how to find good talent. Right? It's not it's not just hiring your friends. Right? There's a skill. In, in, in sort of identifying and finding and then getting good talent to join your team and then building that team out uh, the way that you envision it. Uh, we've heard that over and over again. Uh, we've heard numerous times about these uh, CEO and founders groups or these industry groups where, where mm-hmm. fellow uh, owners of businesses kind of get together uh, and, and sort of discuss ideas. And, and, and you find those all over the country, right? Sometimes they're very regional it's a half a dozen people who get together four times a year for dinner and they sort of share ideas and, and they're very unstructured and others are, you know, monthly meetings that are much more structured. The point being is they're really valuable because you get to share ideas, uh, uh, concepts and ideas from e- with each other. And oftentimes they're non-competing businesses. So, so it's, you know, not a big deal. Uh, but that's another thing that we've heard uh, mentioned uh, over and over again by entrepreneurs. There's this notion of being humble, right, and willingness to learn and open to new ideas, uh, regardless of where those new ideas come from. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we're not the smartest person in the room, <laughs> and, and mm-hmm. listening skills are really important, uh, and we've heard that over and over again from successful entrepreneurs. And then one that we haven't heard all that much, but I think Doug brought up, and I think it was a really good one, and is this notion of what's your stress reliever? Right. What do you do to sort of decompress from your business, take time out and just sort of, you know, relax and re-energize yourself? And that's really important to do that. And everyone has to have something like that. It sounds like for Doug, it was running and bicycling and and sort of that physical activity uh, was his stress reliever. For other people, it might be, you know, sitting in a chair on the beach and reading a book, (laughs) whatever it is. It doesn't matter. That's not the point of what, what, what it is. It's that you actually know what it is for you and you practice that and you do it. So I thought those were, you know, four really good themes that came out of this conversation you had with Doug, uh, that we've heard over and over again. And I think there's a real good lesson that in that. Yeah, I thought so too, Bela. It was, it was good to hear him tell the story. And, um, you know, I guess the last thing to, to me that was interesting and it's personal too, is this whole idea of getting in business with your friends. And uh, there's a lot of risk there. And there's a lot of, of uh, you know, you and I've talked about this a couple of times too, about making sure you have a clear exit strategy and making sure that the assumptions are discussed and shared. And, you you know, we even, we, uh, we were fortunate. He's, Doug still has these great, fantastic uh, lawyer, great, fantastic accountant. Those were two great decisions that we made early on that really helped with the process of kind of, of splitting up the, the essentially of, and, and doing the, uh, the purchase, uh, the buyback of the two partners. Uh, and that was really important that we all had people that we trusted. And, um, cause that's a, it was a, a kind of a, a difficult process, uh, in all honesty, it worked out fine, but, yeah. uh, but a big challenge. So that was the other kind of interesting thing to hear that from Doug's side. And I think for me to think, I haven't really thought about it in a while, but to, to kind of think that through and, and talk about it a little bit openly was, was interesting. You know, when I put my venture capital hat back on, uh, when we look at founding teams, uh, there's a couple of things we look at, right? There, there are teams that have worked together in the past, and maybe they're friends also, but they have worked together. They, they have been in the pits, so to speak, and they've solved problems together, and they understand how to work together. That, to me, was that, was, that went in the plus column, right, when, when you're evaluating a potential investment, if it was friends who never really worked together, but they're friends, right? They're social friends, they're, they're fraternity brothers or whatever, uh, that ne- doesn't necessarily go into the plus column, right? And then there's uh, oftentimes uh, spouses that start a business, mm-hmm. right? And, and at least from my perspective, that was almost always a negative, because there's a lot of stress. And, and we made some investments into, into uh, spouse-founded businesses. Uh, and um, the challenge is there's a lot of stress 
and and when the relation right when the partnership breaks up <laughs> you're not only breaking up the business partners but then there's also a relationship that's being broken up and that's the challenge right both in the friends mm-hmm. situation and in spouses and and then usually the the business really suffers i mean it's hard enough when founders who work together and and people don't see eye to eye or for whatever reason somebody has to leave right and 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 oftentimes yeah, that happens. happens all the time it happens right. all the time right so mm-hmm. it's not unusual so i'm not saying that you know once you start a business you do it for life um so it's not unusual on there there's a lot of stress there but then you add in this additional layer of relationship uh either longtime friends or a spouse spousal relationship and it really complicates things and it and it really brings in so much more emotion into that already very stressful time. Uh, yeah. so and, it, and you can't say never because there's lots of, of examples of when it does work, but lots of times it doesn't work. I think more often it doesn't work. Right. So it's something that, you know, you need to be really cautious and really have a good plan and, and, and things like that. Because I know several people that they have, that both partners work in the business, but it works. And some of it is, is the relationship is really mature. They've been together for a long time and the business is solid and, you know, but yeah, right. there's a lot of risk, a yeah. lot of risk. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I'm not saying it doesn't work. All I'm saying mm. is th- there's, there's more that don't work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it's an extra layer of challenge. Do. Definitely. Right? And I always draw this analogy to, to, to rock and roll bands, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. There's very, I mean, that's a situation where you're living together. You know, the, the people in that group or band are living together, like, you know, nine months a year on the road. I mean, it's really intense. And think about the ones that have lasted, you know, for more than 10 years. <laughs> There's very yeah. few of them. Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. Uh, anyway, definitely. I thought it was a really good conversation you had with him. I'm so happy that we were able to get uh, uh, Doug to uh, to join you in, in that conversation. And uh, I thought there was a lot of good, uh, good points that you guys made. Cool. Well, thanks, Bela. What do you think? Should we call it a day? I think so. Let's do that. Let's wrap it. All right. Well, listeners, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, We hope you find the last hour interesting and thought-provoking. If you have questions about what we discussed, please get in touch with us. Our email is bela.and.mike at gmail.com. So, Bela, have a great week, and I'll see you same time, same place next week. All right. So, signing off from upstate New York. Have a great week, everyone.